July 16, 1945, 5.30 a.m. The sun isn't even up yet, but the New Mexican desert of Ornada del Muerto in the United States suddenly lights up with the power of a dozen suns. This wasn't just any flash of light. It's the first ever detonation of a nuclear weapon, ushering human civilization into the atomic age. Codenamed Trinity, this nuclear test, part of the Manhattan Project, detonated an implosion-designed plutonium bomb, codenamed The Gadget, and had the same design as the Fat Man bomb that was later dropped on Nagasaki. The details of the Trinity test were initially a closely guarded secret, as you can imagine, in the interest of national security. One of the most important quantities that everybody wanted to know was the yield of the atomic bomb, the energy released in the detonation. While the official number of 20 kilotons of TNT was declassified and made public much later, there are two famous stories of scientists who were able to estimate the yield of the bomb. Before official measurements were released, Enrico Fermi, who was in Los Alamos at the time, part of the Manhattan Project, was able to make an estimate. Fermi was famous for estimating complex quantities based on very rudimentary observations. For instance, he estimated the yield of Trinity based on nothing but the distance traveled by pieces of paper he dropped from his hand as the blast wave passed them in the observation deck. I covered this in some detail and its connection to Fermi problems in another video and I encourage you to highly check it out over here. On the other side of the Atlantic, British physicist Jeffrey Ingram Taylor used a set of pictures of the blast that were timestamped and distance scaled to estimate the yield of the bomb. How did he do it? Can you and I reproduce the essence of the calculation in a simpler form? Hang around, because we're going to scribble a few equations and figure this out. It's going to be a blast. Years before Trinity, in 1941, G.I. Taylor was approached by the UK Ministry of Home Security and was told that it might be possible to produce a bomb in which a very large amount of energy would be released by nuclear fission. His task was to report on the likely effect and energy yield of such a weapon. In a 1941 report to the ministry, which was published and made public in 1949, Taylor performed a theoretical discussion of what he called the formation of a blast wave by a very intense explosion. He solved hydrodynamical differential equations, the Navier-Stokes equations, related to how the blast shock wave would affect the density and pressure of the air as the blast wave expanded outwards. These include an equation for mass conservation, energy conservation, an equation of motion, talking about how momentum is changing in time, and finally, one for the thermodynamic equation of state. His analysis aimed to connect the radius of the blast wave as a function of the energy of the explosion, the density of air, and also understand how this radius grew as a function of time. He found this expression where the radius r was a power law in time with an exponent of 2 fifth. Notice also that this radius, it depends on the ratio of the energy to the density of the undisturbed air to a power of 1 fifth. The proportionality constant s depends on other parameters, particularly the ratio of specific heat of the gases in the air. In 1949, in the second part of his paper, Taylor used images of the early moments of the blast that were taken by Professor J. E. Mack of the University of Wisconsin and declassified in 1947. Taylor's work has since captured the popular imagination, and many have tried to simplify or even misrepresent his calculations. Legend has it that Taylor used images from a magazine to get his estimate. But that isn't true. He used the declassified images from the 1947 Mac report. This shows how stories can become oversimplified and distorted over time, emphasizing the need to dig deep to find the truth, a virtue more crucial now than ever.
while Taylor's work was indeed a hydrodynamical masterpiece, can we, you and I, perform a similar calculation that captures the essence of estimating the yield using blast pictures? This is where dimensional analysis is going to become invaluable. While the full detailed solution to the differential equations provides the most authoritative answer to the problem, a quick back of the envelope estimate reveals a lot about what's going on. As the famous physicist Rudolf Peierls once told young Hans Beth, erst kom das denken, dann das integral, which roughly translates to first think, then do the integral. Let's have a look. When thinking about the radius of the blast wave, we can also apply dimensional analysis. What quantities might be relevant? We want to find the set of all quantities which span all possible physical effects without being redundant. In terms of assumptions, we can assume that the fireball is spherical in nature and the ground has a negligible effect. We can also assume that the bomb released all its energy almost instantaneously from a point source because the size of the bomb is going to be much smaller than the size of the fireball. We then want to relate the radius of the blast wave with the amount of time that has elapsed after the explosion and the energy yield of the blast. Now, dimensionally speaking, the radius of the blast wave has dimensions of length. The time elapsed obviously has dimensions of time and the dimensions of energy are basically given by mass length square per time square. A quick check for this is that energy, for example, kinetic energy, which is one half mv square, mass times velocity square, would have dimensions of ml square t to the minus 2. The rate at which the radius grows would also depend upon the density, pressure and temperature of the air, both inside and outside the fireball. So for example, if this is the surface of my blast wave, I have my pressure p, temperature t and density rho inside the fireball and their corresponding counterparts, pressure p0, temperature t0 and density rho0 outside the fireball. However, hydrodynamics and thermodynamics would connect these variables through the energy of the blast E and therefore they are not independent variables. Furthermore, knowing just the density of air would allow us to find even the pressure and temperature of the air. So all in all, we can use just the density of undisturbed air outside the blast wave as our other independent variable. Thereby, we want to find our connection of the radius with the time elapsed, the energy released, and also the density of undisturbed air outside. This density has dimensions of mass per volume, so mass times L to the minus 3. We are primarily seeking a relationship between the radius of the blast wave and the time elapsed after the explosion. So we basically want to eliminate the dimension of mass from all our quantities. Notice how the ratio energy of the blast divided by the density of the undisturbed air has dimensions of L to the fifth t to the minus two. Just by looking at that, we can make a claim that the following combination, E over rho naught, divided by r to the fifth times t square better be a constant because this combination is going to be dimensionless. Rearranging this, it gives me that my radius of the blast wave will depend on the time with the power law of 2 fifth, the energy of the blast with the power of 1 fifth, the density of undisturbed air rho naught to the minus one fifth and I also have a proportionality constant s that I'm going to put out front. Some quick sanity checks. R increases as time increases. If the energy of the blast is higher, the radius of the blast wave 
will also be larger for a given time. That sounds good. And finally, if I have a higher density of air, the radius of the blast wave is going to be lower. And that is because the blast wave will have to push against a denser envelope of air, many more air molecules to push through, thereby leading to a lower radius. It all makes sense. And we shouldn't ignore our dimensionless constant s, which cannot be determined by this dimensional analysis. Many popular accounts of this calculation either completely ignore s or assume it to be 1. Both are incorrect. Taylor spent pages of calculations trying to come up with an estimate of this dimensionless number s, and we shouldn't overlook that. There is no hand wavy way to estimate s. We must respect Taylor's calculations. It's a humbling reminder that science can often be complex. And that's all right. We must embrace the rigor. It's necessary and it's worth it. Recently, a paper published by Jorge Diaz and Samuel Rigby made better estimates about this dimensionless number s, and they came up with s to be about 1.033 for normal air, and we're going to use that in our calculation going further. Our functional form for r as a function of time takes a classic power law form, and power laws are often tricky to work with. So we'll do what every first year undergrad in physics does, take the log on both sides. Now remembering the property of logs that they convert multiplicative elements into additive elements, what we get is that log of the radius will be log of time to the two-fifth plus log of, I'm going to keep everything else combined together, s energy to the one-fifth divided by rho naught to the one-fifth. Again, remembering the additive nature of the logs, I can write this as log r, I can pull out the exponent from t to the two, two fifth, and I will get two fifth times log t plus a constant independent of time log s e over rho naught to the one fifth. This is our beloved equation for a straight line y equals m x plus c. In our case, log r and log t are linearly dependent through a slope m equals 2 fifth and the intercept c contains information about the energy of the blast wave. Let's put our model to the test now. In his report, J.E. Mack released images during the first few milliseconds of the blast. For instance, this image, taken at 25 milliseconds, compares the blast wave and the fireball with the Washington Monument. Puts things in perspective, doesn't it? Taylor used a total of 25 images from the Mac report and the Ministry of Supply for his analysis, but we are going to use just four images to capture the basic idea behind the calculation. Four images taken at 16 milliseconds, 25 milliseconds, 53 milliseconds, and 62 milliseconds. To analyze this data, I've written some Python code to help us out. We'll start by importing some powerful packages. And here is our data. The radius of the blast wave as a function of the different timestamps where the radius has been read off the images from the Mac report. We enter our data as data arrays and when we plot it, log r versus log t, the data points indeed lie along a straight line, which is an encouraging sign. Now we just need to find the line of best fit through this data, for which I am using NumPy's polyfit module, which basically fits a polynomial, and I'm asking it to fit a polynomial of order 1, which is a straight line to our variables, log r versus log t. It returns the slope and intercept of the best fit. And there you go. Look at that. The slope of the best fit comes out to be 0.4, which is exactly 2 fifths as predicted. The intercept of the best fit, c, 
can also be read off to be 6.35 and carries essential information about the energy of the blast wave. Once we plot the data and the best fit together, that's how it looks like. It's a fantastic agreement. And now we can use this to back calculate and find out the energy of the explosion. We found out our intercept to be about 6.35. And in this expression, we already know that the dimensionless constant S has a value of about 1.033. We would also like to know the density of undisturbed air at standard room temperature and pressure, which comes out to be around 1.29 kg per meter cube. Now that we have everything in this expression, we can rearrange it to estimate the energy yield of the explosion. Doing so, we get the energy yield is going to be, I take the take the exponentiation over here. So I get e to the intercept divided by my constant s to the power 5 times rho naught. Putting all the numbers back, I get the energy yield to be about 6.7 times 10 to the 13 joules of energy released in the explosion. Now that's a lot of energy. Converting it into standard bomb yield unit, it comes out to be about 16 kilotons of TNT. Incidentally, this is also roughly the same amount of energy that was released in the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima just a few weeks later. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. Taylor's estimate of the bomb yield wasn't just a simple mathematical exercise. It was a testament to the power of the human mind. Armed with a few photographs, some foundational equations, and a deep understanding of the workings of the physical world, Taylor was able to unveil the destructive force behind the most powerful weapon ever created without even being there. We must remember that the world is full of challenges that require our curiosity, our creativity, and a commitment to truth. The equations we scribble today might very well be solutions to problems of tomorrow. So let's embrace the complexity, celebrate the rigor, and keep pushing the boundaries of what we know. For the next great discovery might just be one equation away. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.